May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. I don't know about you, but I have so many questions. They ring loudly within me with the words of the litany that we just pray together. How long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? When I see that there is no justice, when I see that those who crush the dignity of others walk unperturbed while thousands and thousands are locked away in prisons, cages, asylums, and clinics. When I see that some are definitely more equal than others in their access to education, health care, jobs, housing, and opportunities to pursue their own happiness and, those, and the happiness of others. When I see that our societies are divided by opportunities and recognition, by segregation and alienation, by hatred and resentment, when I see that in our political system lies and self-interest, narcissism and chauvinism reign, and that all over the world democracy is becoming a farce, when I see how quick we are to wage wars. What have we done? Where are you, Lord? Where are we? When I see that we have probably passed the planetary tipping point, but nothing, nothing can shake us out of the stupor of our mass consumption, exploitation, and complacency. Let the world go to hell, let half continents burn, let apparently natural diseases and societal upheavals shake the earth. But sure, let us continue to build our infrastructure for cars. Let us enjoy our takeout burger and our convenient plane travel, and let's just build bigger walls to insulate ourselves from the consequences. What have we done? Where are you, Lord? Where are we? When I see how random chance events, how easily random chance events can crush life and hopes. When I see that your world fails to give comfort or is even weaponized. When I see that supposedly Christian values are used to exclude and discriminate. When I see that the name of the Lord is wielded for religious, national, and racial supremacy. What have we done? Where are you, Lord? Where are we? When I see that even in such an intentional community as ours, there are walls dividing us. That many of our members are lonely and isolated and do not feel like they belong. That many of our members are insecure and poor. That many of our members suffer emotional and sometimes even physical violence in this community. That many of our members are afraid to speak, are not sure whether they are accepted whether they will be respected, whether their voices will count as much as those of others. What have we done? Where are you, Lord? Where are we? I have so many questions. And among them, on top of them, the nagging super question. What am I even doing here? Deciphering texts, mincing words, and maybe, maybe small scale institutional reform, trickle down education, and a thesis or a sermon that might just change someone's mind. In all the turmoil of the world, doing theology is a very questionable business. 
How dare we sit here in this prestigious, beautiful, and neat place? and read and write our books as if nothing had happened. And aren't we, who aspire to be leaders for the church and society, light on the hill and salt of the world, are we not the ones who are supposed to come up with answers, solutions, provide comfort and closure for people's questions? I must admit that in the years that I have been doing theology, my questions have become more rather than less. What are we even doing here? This morning, I opened the Intro to Theology class with Luke's story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I claimed along the lines of the story that theology is a conversation a conversation which we're having among ourselves on the road. I didn't exactly lie. <laughs> but I may have made it sound much more peaceful, much more serene, than at least I myself feel most of the days. And you know how it is. One theologian, three opinions. So let's listen to another story of a different road and a different encounter. The scripture reading for today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 32. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the men saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket. And when Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him, then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob but Israel, for you have wrestled with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob said to him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, for I have seen God's face face to face and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Pano, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the, the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. The word of the Lord. Not as serene a conversation on the road. In Jacob's story, it becomes clear that the road is a rather perilous place and that the encounter with this other may be far from peaceful. So to amend or complement the metaphor I used this morning of the conversation, let me now suggest doing theology as we're doing here means wrestling with God and the world. And even on the road to Emmaus, the disciples were wrestling. Wrestling with hard questions and with not having any answers. Remember, their story picks up right after the Gospel of Mark ends so weirdly. The grave that marks the end of all our, our hopes. Disillusionment, frustration, fear, and trembling. And the disciples are moving away even if not moving on precisely, not knowing what to make of their strange experiences and the even stranger appearances that are haunting them. Their conversation, far from being serene, is marked by deep wrestling. 
Jacob on the road is also wrestling. Wrestling with his guilt, with the brother, with the brother he has betrayed, with his anxiety of what the future will bring and whether he has a place in it. Jacob is wrestling with all that assails him in a dark hour of the night. And before he knows it, he finds himself wrestling physically as well, trying to cross over to the other side, but he cannot. God, God's self, stands in his way. You cannot pass. Jacob may not even understand who or what he's actually wrestling with, or does he? Do we ever? At the bottom of our questions, it is not God who gives us answers. It is God who stands in our way. God draws us into this fight. Is it possible to wrestle with God and the world and to prevail? Or what would it even mean to prevail in such a conflict? From Jacob's story, we get a glimpse. At the very least, he's no longer running. No longer running from his past and his demons. He confronts them, confronts God. He's now committed not to let go, even if it means the end of it, even if it means the end of him. He will not be overcome. He will wrestle through this. And in the darkness of this stubbornness, this desperation, really, Jacob, who had first been assailed, now becomes the assailant. And God is not able to disentangle God's self either. I will not let you go, demands Jacob, unless you bless me. Does Jacob win? Well, he survives the fight. He doesn't get answers or solutions, but he is transformed. And he is allowed to continue his journey, changed. He comes away with a new name and a blessing, which will be with him. On the road, he continues to travel with all the anxieties, the guilt, and the new beginnings. He also comes away with a limp. This fight marks him for life. It makes him who he is, down to his name and his physical appearance. In the hard questions that we have today, with all our anxieties and all our guilt, we too may ask, is it possible to wrestle with God and the world and to prevail, even as we cannot come out unscathed? Because God is limping too. God does not come out of God's wrestling with this world unscathed, pristine, and vastly superior. God has wounds to show from God's wrestling with us, wounds that forever mark who this God is. Look at Christ's hands, feet, and side. Because it's not just we who are wrestling with God and the world and asking all the hard questions. God has questions too, even as we all too conveniently ignore them or betray them by prematurely pretending that they have already been answered, the theologian's temptation. <laughs> In the opening lit litany, we heard a few of God's hard questions. That God asks us these questions is both terrifying and a ground for hope. Terrifying and a ground for hope because they show that God is faithful. God is not done with us. God stays in conversation with us and won't let us go. And God is still waiting for our reply. Terrifying and a ground for hope because they show that God is moved, 
that God suffers from this world, its injustice, its despair, its God forsakenness as much as we do. Maybe more. Maybe more than we finite creatures can fathom. And God is asking us to stand with God in this suffering, to not let go. Maybe God can be wrestled with. Maybe the world can be wrestled with. Maybe that is precisely the faithfulness that is demanded of us. Bonhoeffer's poem puts our questions and suffering, our need and our longing, in deep solidarity with the questions and suffering, the need and the longing of all the world. All have questions. All are in distress. All need redemption. We're not smarter than anyone else. We're not holier than anyone else. And I regret to tell you, at the end of the day, we may not have any more answers than anyone else. The only thing that may set us apart, maybe, is that maybe we're just a little more stubborn. <laughs> that we refuse to give up on God and the world. That we stubbornly cling to God's faithfulness, to God's faithfulness to this unredeemed world. If we are stubbornly faithful, that means we do not walk away from God. We do not let God go. We do not let God off the hook. But we also do not leave God alone with the weight of the world. We do not give easy answers. Instead, we lean into the questions hard and we confront God with them. Lifting the world's suffering and injustices, our fragmentation and brokenness and despair and this whole unredeemed existence up and holding it before God, a defiant prayer that refuses to let go because things are just not right. We demand a response. We demand a blessing. You have promised God. Why have you forsaken us? Where are you? What is your name? If we're stubbornly faithful, that also means we do not walk away from the world. We sit with God in God's suffering from this world and we confront the world. We hold God's suffering and despair, God's own wounds, before the world and we demand a response, demand a blessing. We have been called to be God's creatures, God's people. What have we done? What are we doing? Where the fuck are we? That's what being Christian, that's what doing theology is about. Being stubbornly faithful, staying with the trouble, and wrestling with God and the world until they yield a blessing. Somewhere in this faithful wrestling, there may even be a strange peace to be found. The restless peace Abraham found, who refused to accept certain doom and who bargained with God for the lives of the world. The restless peace Hagar found, who called God by a new name and claimed God's promises for those whom God had overlooked. The restless peace Jacob found, wrestling with whatever assailed him in his dark and crooked road and finding that it may have been God. The restless peace who found the disciples on the road to Emmaus. With the promise of their peace, we too continue this conversation. We too wrestle with the promises, with our distress, with our lack of understanding, and with the queer hope that sometimes, sometimes a stranger on the road will encounter us, that sometimes our hearts will burn inside of us and open up new beginnings, that sometimes God will meet us on this road, and that even as we're still unaware of God's presence, we are being blessed, we are being nourished, and we are being sent back on the road with a limp, a new name, and with the dawn of a new day on our faces. 
the restless peace of God in all its stubborn faithfulness to this unredeemed world, a peace that may then greet the next traveler we meet. And may this peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.